Right, tonight on The Living Legends, we get to watch the first of a two-part interview with a pioneering woman in Kenyan media. She worked at the BBC and later at the African Broadcasting Service that is now KBC. She later became the first African to open a publicity firm. She's a prolific author with her first book having been published in 1974. On The Living Legends tonight, pioneering broadcaster Mudoni Likamani speaks to Daniel Wahome. Good day to you. My name is Daniel Wahome, and welcome to this edition of The Living Legends. Today's episode features a trailblazer in Kenya's media industry. She started off as a teacher before she eventually got into broadcasting. Think of programs like Shangazi Nawatoto. She is the first African to own a publicity farm. And she has written so many books. Think of one that is about child trafficking and the, co and, and the pain that comes with it. In today's edition of The Living Legends, we speak to Grandma Mudoni Likimani. Welcome. And thank you for giving us your time on The Living Legends. It's a pleasure. Yes. So we'll go straight, and this is biographical. So you could just tell us about your early life, where you were born, and growing up. I was born at Missionary Mission, Kahuya Mission, in Moranga District. But I later on married, got married in Mass Island. Therefore, my home now is Maasai, but I'm brought up at Kahuya Mission, where I even was a teacher after I finished my education. You know, um, having been born um, in the mid-1930s, and at that point, it was difficult for girls to get an education. So tell us how you got into school getting into primary school and eventually getting post-primary education. First of all, I would like to let you know that uh, previously education was being run by missionaries where my father was also a priest and education all the developed areas of Kenya. If you check, you'll find that uh, it is missionaries who used to run education. And therefore I grew up in a center, educational center of Kawia Mission. And that's how I got into education early in the time. You now leave the classroom and you are a teacher and eventually you are now on the other uh, at the other end of the classroom. What were your teaching experiences? Very good. I was even a <clears throat> uh, training teachers at Kahuye Mission before I later on got into an age when I went to have a family and I got married and I left the teaching site and I went to live in a place where my school was running a school but even that as a teacher you are always a teacher you will always find something to teach. I married a person, I met a husband from a Maasai community. There were no schools there, but even so, I will go and start teaching people wherever I am. And uh, I was teaching there, not uh, as an employee as such, but I was always running, educating people. Even in Atongong I was teaching, and uh, in Kajiado I was teaching. You take me to Narok, which is also a Maasai, I'll find a place to go and work with the other women and teach them. So let me say, my life, full life, is educating. A scholarship to go study in London, and this actually became part of your, what I would call your, your uh, became the foundation of your broadcasting career. 
tell us about the London years because it was just before independence and there was a lot of Pan-African conversations then. I think many people fear to, uh, to go for a challenge. I just saw in, in uh, East Africa, the then East African standard advertisement of people being asked who would like to go and study overseas. But we were not independent. It was a colonial government. And then I, I just took my old papers, I applied, and uh, I got excited to see a woman who is also wanting to go to Britain. There were few men, about five, ten. They started, uh, colonialists started agreeing to educate Kenyans. So I applied, and uh, later on I was, I got a letter to go for an, an interview. I never forgot that interview, it was opposite Norfolk Hotel, near your broadcasting place. I went there, and um, some uh, rough women, Muzungu women, wondered who is this African women wanting to go to, to London. And the first question was, even you want to go to London? Yes. Why do you want to go? To learn more? I, I just knew what. She was very rude, I still never forget that. Why do you want to learn education? To have more knowledge and to learn education like you have. I too can do it. It was exactly outside Norfolk Hotel and opposite in um, National Theatre. There was a little glass there and they go and they looked and looked and said, you, be you better let this girl go. So I wasn't sure whether they are going to give me, but I was shocked that in a few days I got a letter. You have been accepted to go to London. As you were studying, uh, there were lots, you know, there were many people from East Africa who were there, uh, living in London, some st uh, st studying, others involved in political work. You had a lot of meetings with them. What was the Pan-African scene then? Uh, we were all interested with what is going on politically. But here I was, sent there under the colonialism. <laughs> and therefore I was under them. They were the people who were feeding me. They would give me money. When I finished my money, I go to tell them I, have, I need some more money. So I dare not talk about much about it but inside me I was political worse than some people they knew <laughs> during this time hope it's still there and at one corner of London because I was in a college in, in London there was a big building called East Africa House mm -hmm. like a club where Muzungus will go there. And um, there were no African women there going there, but there were people from Uganda, from Tanzania, Muzungus, who were working. And me, I'm now a colonialist. I also go there, particularly on Fridays, because you'll find books there, newspapers there. You'll hear much about politics in Africa there. The worst politics was from Kenya, with fighting for freedom. And um, I will go there, and I like to go there on Friday, if I find it interesting, because I wasn't very far, I would come again on Saturday, sit there, I'll find a, a lot of people in uh, Uganda, Tanzania, some Kenyans, but most of the Kenyan people, were, the ladies in Kenya, were doing nothing and they were far from London. So I was one of the few, if any, around uh, London. And there, I even met some very interesting people from uh, Tanzania. 
one was studying law called uh, Mr. Bomani, who later on became the Attorney General of uh, Tanzania. This is long before we had independent. So I knew this man. And when we sit there, you want to speak in Kiswahili, I knew Kiswahili. We talk, and you feel we're at home. And uh, they made me very happy, very made me comfortable. And um, that's how I even became more interested in speaking and teaching uh, broadcasting. And then there were some few people at the BBC at the same time. One of them was, I think, uh, I think Stephen Gikumu was there, John Izao was there. There were people from Tanzania. And when they come, you want to show up, okay, Swahili, you will feel good, you feel at home. Talk politics in okay, Swahili. And um, I became a, a buddy of this group who were coming to the East Africa house. Hope. Next time I go to Britain, I'll check whether that sender is still there. And there's the people who made me know about BBC. Because there were some Tanzanians also who are broadcasting at the BBC. And we speak in Kiswahili, showing off how much Swahili you know. And then they say, why don't you come and help us? We don't have any woman talking in Kiswahili at the BBC. You are actually the, the pioneer Swahili broadcaster. I think, uh, I think the Akikumu was there, perhaps Johnny Zao, and people from Tanzania. But uh, these people from Taz uh, Tanzania, the Bomanis and his brother Emmanuel, they were the ones who made people have a, a I believe that I could speak in Kiswahili. And then they said, come we try it, come we try it. So I said, but you know, I'm a full-time student at the Institute, Institute of uh, Adult Education first. Then I went to take uh, nutrition. So when I was there, I started uh, going there, and they will interview me in Kiswahili. They found I can speak Kiswahili very well. And I learned how to speak his Swahili well. And this is the time people were trying to get independent. Even the the colonial, the when the Commonwealth, when politicians were fighting at the government uh, Muzungu offices. It is around this time they come, and when they come, they will come to East Africa House. When we are there, we all want to show off how much is why we do. Later on, they said, you must come and help us. So I started going there every weekend. They, they said, but don't let me miss my studies. I said, no, we can even record you on weekend and take your material. So that's how we started going there. Part-time broadcasting. Part-time broadcasting. Kiswahili. Kiswahili. When people were at Lancaster Conference, I was in London, and I will go there and later go to, in the evening to listen to what they have been fighting for. One good thing about the, the British, they don't care what you believe in. They don't bother about this politics and what not. Those who are there, they'll say, they don't care. They will know you, they'll be happy. And uh, I knew them. There was only one woman in this, uh, among these people who were during conf this conference called Priscilla. Abuao. She was a, a lady from Western Kenya. And I used to go and talk to her and we go to her hotel and we eat it together before they go to this uh, fighting for freedom. So I was so close to her and we go together and we speak in Kiswahili. We go to East Africa house. I knew the family of Bumanis. I knew the Mayajas of, the, of uh, Uganda. 
I knew a lot of people in East Africa. Now, you, there you are, you picked up with the BBC, you come back to Kenya, and you yes. the Africa Broadcasting Service. Now, then VOK, now KBC. Tell us about that transition. I didn't. It was a 100% career change from teaching to broadcasting. Yes, what happened is that um, when I came, I wasn't going to broadcasting. Um, I'm ad doing adult education. Then after that, they, they, they started looking for me. Where is that a lady who was talking at the BBC? Where did she go? She came back to Kenya. So in fact, they came to look for me. And I started going there again on part-time basis. Then I became full-time. And when I was in England, I was very lucky. I'm under colonialist. And uh, we, you get exposure to people of other African countries. I became very close to women from Ghana. I still remember them. From Ghana, they were my very good friends. We became close with the people from Caribbean. And then uh, we had a, a gang of black women. And uh, in Kenya, I was um, a member of YWCA. When I went there, I continued taking part in YWCA. They had a big center in a place called uh, Chest House. And I will go there, you can go there, you can eat there, you mix with the people from all over the world. And this broadens my out outlook in life. Uh -huh. Yes. Programs you did there. Yes. Kipindi Chakina Mama. Yes. Tell us about that program. I, <laughs> you see, after I was there, I did um, end broadcasting. And I'm already in adult education. Every time there is a conference run by the, the, the colonialist, whether it's with the Ghanaians or with the Caribbean or with the who, I used to be sent a note to go. So I came to know a lot of women from other nations, mostly Caribbeans, I don't know why Ghanaians, we became very close. Uh, even now we communicate with them. And then I found it very interesting and uh, I was a teacher before. So that's how I became that and I widened my outlook in life. And um, when I came back to Kenya, what do you do in broadcast? Just telling you to salam, salam, and all this. That is not, nothing. You have to talk and educate. I've done nutrition course. I, I did a nutri a di uh, nutrition diploma. So I know about feeding. I know about health. I know about so many things which are related to women. And when I came back, and they used to hear my programs coming from BBC London, they started to look for me. Where is that girl, young lady who used to talk to us? What happened? Oh, she came back to Kenya, where they looked for me. I was already doing some work on nutrition and things like that. And uh, that's how I started doing these programs. When I came to be VOK, part time first, they, they were not teaching anything in for women. Is it just a salam and what not I said you can't do this. These women want to learn how to take care of their children. Hygiene, nutrition so many things. You tell them on the radio. So I started program for women and I really mess, uh, liked it. There was a, the director was Richard Koske at the time. 
and he was very keen about it. So I became a teacher, lecturer on the on the media. Aha. Yes. Pioneering it is. Shangazi na watoto. Shangazi, that's the one. Because I was doing both. Mm. I'll do women, I'll do children. Yes. Some um, people may not know this, but I think just around that time, because we'd like to come into your people while well, timing uh, public relations. Yes. You acted as Idi Amin's wife. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> what was it, you know, acting with that huge guy, just I used, as a leader? <laughs> I used to do so many things. I was brought up by missionaries. When I was in Britain, everywhere I told British, this uh, colonialist and uh, or do, there is something going on, they allow me. They even pay for the ticket to go to Scotland or, or where or where or, or anywhere. And I started interacting with the women of the world. And uh, even uh, Caribbeans, you find they knew so much. And I started being involved with this. And when I was doing, working in, uh, studying in Britain, I was also going to do some programs at, at um, KBC. Uh, not the KBC, BBC. And then I became more known than I knew him myself. And uh, the more they, they go, got to me, the more I want to go closer to them. And when I came back, although I was start, uh, doing the same thing, I found myself a more of a, you can teach through broadcasting. You can talk about health, you can talk about nutrition, you can talk about child care, you can all sorts of things. And uh, that's how I became like that. Captivating interview, an absolute legend. That is the first part of the story of pioneering broadcaster Madhoni Likemani. The second and final part of the interview will run next Saturday and we shall hear about her literary works and her role in the struggle for independence. And just to remind our viewers, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. we'll be having an exclusive joint interview with our Deputy President Rigathi Keshagwa at his residence. Our reporter Nancy Okware will be representing KBC. Make sure you stay tuned. And that's all from our newsroom. I am Fayaz Qureshi. Have a good night.